what do you want? What do you want? What do you care about? When you look back over your life and you look forward in your dreams, what's the common theme? What is it that bugs you that you're trying to make it go away? What is it that excites you that you're trying to bring in? What do you care about? What do you want? Because when you're clear on what you want and you stay that course, the world starts looking for ways to give it to you. Welcome to the Small Steps Big Wins Podcast. I'm dedicated to helping you take control of your life. Are you ready? Let's go do this. Jim, I love to let my guests introduce themselves and then we'll jump from there. Sure. I'm a professional speaker and author. I've been doing that since 1977, full time. It's been my only career. I've written 26 books that are published around the world in multiple languages. Uh, my latest one came out in 2024. I've got another one coming out next week called Relationship Selling, Managing Human Connections as Sales Assets. And it's a, a rework of a, a earlier book that I'm well known for. I've delivered 3,500 professional paid convention speeches all over the world, China, South America, Europe, Australia. Uh, been in every state in the United States as a paid speaker. Uh, every province of Canada except the Yukon. And other than that, I'm bored. No, <laughs> I've, I've been busy and blessed. I've been president of the National Speakers Association, uh, inducted in the Speaker Hall of Fame, the Sales Marketing Hall of Fame in London. Um, I've got a TED Talk that's got 2.7 million views, Congrats. which amazes me because I didn't promote it. Um, life's I, pretty good. Yeah, I would say speaking is your superpower. What was your most interesting place that you ever spoke in or most memorable for you? Boy, I tell you, how long have you got? Uh, because even the top It's your 10 podcast. Would, yeah, the top <laughs> 10 would be a lot. Uh, it, a lot of stories. Man, I, you know, China has been amazing. I started in 2015 doing lecture tour, tours of mainland China. And I've now been there 20 times to 25 major cities. And, and China actually has that many. I went to two that I'd never heard of before on this last trip, Nanyang and Chung, uh, uh, Chuangzhou, both of which are over 5 million people. I mean, it, here in the United States, we hadn't even heard of these towns, and they're as big as Houston. You know, good heavens. And, and you go to a place like Shanghai, and it's around 30 million people in the metroplex of Shanghai. 30 million, that's LA plus New York, plus Houston, plus Chicago combined. That's mind blowing right there. I know. Now, when you go to speak in China, is it, are you, you speaking in English? Yes. And you have I'm an interpreter? English through an interpreter. Yeah. And okay. so I do a paragraph and then I do another paragraph and then do <laughs> another call and wow. I'm speaking five and a half hours a day to one to 3,000 people at a time. Wow. Wow, so I was going to say. It's a real, that. real thrilling experience. And when they bring me into the room, I swear this is true and I can prove it. I've got the video. They chant, we love Jim. They don't know who Jim is, but they think that's the thing to say. And so there are 3,000 people saying, we love Jim. We love Jim. Jim, G E E M, <laughs> music going on and spotlights all over the room. And I mean, wow, it's like Rocky Balboa, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's huge. That's but awesome. That, that's sure distinctive. <laughs> oh, well, oh my gosh. I, did you ever think back in, take yourself back to 1975, 1976? Did you ever think you would be here today back oh, then? Yeah. No, no. Back then, I, my dream was to grow up to be a, a professional motivational speaker. I wanted to be like Earl Nightingale, who was big at the time, and he was mostly a radio personality, or Cabot Robert, who's the founder of the National Speakers Association. Zig Ziglar was still new, so I didn't have him to look to yet. And um, I, I just wanted to do that. 
And I never figured that I would speak in all 50 states. I never figured that I would speak, you know, that I would go to the White House, that I would be hired by the the first lady, Nancy Reagan, hired me to train the just say no speakers back during the Reagan era. I, it never occurred to me that Zig Ziglar would become a friend and that Ziglar Corporation would hire me to keynote their event. Or, you know, and I, I had been a Toastmaster for three months back when I was in my 20s. And uh, years later, after I became a full time professional speaker, now remember, I'd been a Toastmaster for three months. So I kind of got in and drifted away. Well, in 1995, they hired me to be the opening keynote speaker for their opening ceremonies of their world convention in San Diego. So I did it. In 2001, they brought me in to give me the Golden Gavel Award, which they had given to Walter Cronkite, Earl Nightingale. Since then, Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, people like that, you know, big, humongous names. Um, And then they brought me back in 2022 for the third time to be the opening keynote speaker on their main stage of their international program. And they've never brought another speaker back three times in the history of Toastmasters. Wow. Well, for those who don't know, can you tell us what Toastmasters is? I know what it is, but. It's a worldwide organization of 16,800 clubs in countries all over uh, that is, they have 360,000 members and uh, they train people in communication, public speaking and leadership skills. Oh, well, thank you for explaining that. I want to jump back to what you were talking about before. And I want to pull out the one thing that you said. So you had a vision. Oh, yeah. Of what you wanted to do. Talk about the importance of having a vision in one's life. In 19, I've still got my notes from from way back in the day. In 1972, I was a overweight, out of shape clerk at the Little Rock, Arkansas Housing Authority, the Urban Renewal Agency. And in that position, I was making $525 a month. And I was an assistant to a man who was not busy, literally. His name was Bob Moore, and he didn't need help. And I was his assistant. And so I was bored to tears. And I sat there and I read books on urban renewal because it was the Housing Authority. And that didn't interest me. So I I read the Bible cover to cover at work in three months. That's some serious spare time. And uh, I had a little bit of work to do, but not much. And so I'm trying to figure out what I want to do for a living. And I hear in the next room a radio broadcast. And it was a little five-minute show called Our Changing World by Earl Nightingale, the Dean of Personal Motivation. And so I I listened to what he said. And that day in 1972, he said literally this, quote, if you will spend one hour extra each day studying your chosen field, you'll be a national expert in that field in five years or less, close quote. That hit me like an oncoming train. I just sat there stunned. I could do that. That's the first time in my life it occurred to me I could make a difference. Because my dad was a telephone repairman. Mom was a homemaker. We didn't know anybody with money. Uh, You know, dad didn't have a college education. Neither did I. I'd been a couple of years. That was all. And so I wasn't around any high achievers. I wasn't inspired by them. And here's a guy on the radio saying, Jim, you could make a difference with just an extra hour each day. And I said, well, heck, I'm a government clerk. I got eight hours a day. You know, I could do this by next week. You could, yeah, and, you could expedite that. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So I started thinking, what do I want to do when I grow up? And I was newly married with a baby at home and, and, and uh, you know, I was out of shape, as I mentioned. And, and I was smoking two packs a day. So I was just a likable loser. And I thought, I want to do what that guy on the radio does. I want to help people grow. Well, I had two problems. The first problem was I had 
personally not achieved anything. And second, if I want to be a speaker, I had nothing to say. So how am I going to be a professional speaker and be, you know, help people grow when I haven't even grown as a person? And so I just kept thinking, you know, what could I do, Sue? Finally, it hit me. I'll take his advice. I'll spend an extra hour each day studying human development, which I knew nothing about. And I studied all the classics, like Think and Grow Rich, Power of Positive Thinking, and How to Win Friends and Influence People, and you know all those classic books of the day. And personal development in 1972 was a tiny little sliver of society. Today, it's huge. It's a multi-billion dollar enterprise. But back then, there wasn't even a section on self-improvement in the library. And if you went to a bookstore, you'd have to search all day to find something that was a how-to book. Almost all the books were novels or, or history or something like that. Um, so I, I found these resources and I became, as I've mentioned, fanatical about studying human development. I mean, to the point where my circle of friends kind of drifted away. They thought, you know, we still like Jim, but it, he's a bit much. I was going to we ask you about that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. The people around yeah. you, they started to see that you were changing and you were going in a different direction. How did yeah. you make that? How'd that make you feel back then when here you are walking through something and it's totally 180 degrees different than the other people around you? Obviously, you're yeah. not going with the flow at that point. Uh, how did you feel about that? And then what continued to propel you not to pull you back into your friend group? Well, I was absolutely committed to the idea of becoming an expert in the field of personal development. And this was before I knew it was possible, but I figured if I just never get off the path, if I stay on that course for the rest of my career, I'll sooner or later I'll make it. It may be longer than I thought, or maybe more expensive or more painful than I thought, but that's what I want to do. So I'm going to do it. So I made the commitment to become a, an authority in the field of personal development. Um, that led me to finding some other people who were interested in the field of psychology and applied behavioral science and all that. And, and I started getting together with them. And so I, it, it didn't really bother me that my other friends kind of drifted away because like we didn't terminate a friendship. We just stopped getting together because I was only interested in this and they wanted to sit around and watch sports and, you know, drink and tell stories. And yeah, that's nice. I'll do that once, but it, it, only that Saturday and then I'm going back to the program. Right. Um, so I, I went to seminars and there weren't many back then. You had to really look to find them. And I'd sit down and write out my goals like this is a list of 11 qualities I wanted to develop in me, kind of like the Ben Franklin virtues. You know, he listed the qualities he wanted to cultivate in himself. And then I took these ideas and I broke them into one thing at a time and put them on the back of a business card. Like this one says, speak well of all, praise my family, friends and acquaintances, become known as one who always has a good comment about others, eliminate criticism. So I put that, it's on the back of a business card. I put it on the bathroom mirror and I had another one I put on the visor in my car so that I would see it every day. And then when I felt like I had a grasp on that one, then I'd work on this one. And this one says, healthy, do some exercise each day that will tax me as much as a mile run. Eat and drink with moderation, to drink maximum uh, at social gatherings. Some of these are kind of faded from water stains yeah. over the years. This is oh 1974. 
Oh my God, that's amazing. I, you know, like right now, this is on YouTube as well and video on Spotify. I hope people go to the, just go to the video, bypass the podcast and see this cool stuff that you're holding Thank up you. that I, I am just amazed that you still have it from 1972. I mean, we're going back almost 50 years now and you still yeah. have it there. And I, you know, it, if it were me, it would just be a constant sense of not only one feeling accomplishment, but then encouragement to continue to keep going. What I find fascinating about that is that probably without you even knowing it, having those little reminders on the back of a card and putting them on your mirror and reading them over daily, you are actually re reprogramming your mind. Oh, yeah. And here's one you can see it's just as faded as can be. Yeah. Um, gosh, it's hard for me to read <laughs> anyway. It, <laughs> I've still got these, you know, right here in my desk. Yeah, and, and I look at it today, and I still am working on the on the same things. Yeah, like this one says, speak ill of no one, never complain nor criticize, resist the temptation to point out other people's faults, either directly or through sarcasm. Mm -hmm. um, be patient and tolerant, forgiving, em empathetic, seek to understand, don't judge. Remember that all people are perfect for their current stage of development. Wow. You know, wow. if they knew how to do better or could do yeah. better, they would have already done it, but maybe they need inspiration or maybe they need a little more time or maybe, maybe they need help or resources or something like that. Uh, or maybe nobody believes in them. So maybe I could be that resource for, for a person. So that's the kind of thing I was working on. I wanted to be a good person. In China, on my recent tours, I would have people come up and ask me at the end of a speech, uh, speaker, teacher, how do I become great speaker? How do I become a great speaker? Well, I think most of them who ask me that, and I got that question often, in those words, I think they were trying to ask a good question rather than find out what the answer was. So I think they wanted to get an A in class for asking good questions. You know what I mean? And so I, I recognize what they were asking, but I also wanted to advise them on where they were coming from in asking it. So they come up and they say, teacher, how do I become a great speaker? And I would say, Become a great person and agree to give speeches. And they'd look at me kind of confused. And I would say, being able to give speeches in a wonderful way is a nice skill, but it's not what will get you booked to speak to thousands of people on important topics. What will get you those bookings is being a person who matters, a person of substance. Be a great person. And even if you have a speech impediment, even if your language is not particularly eloquent, even if you're hard to listen to, you will still be asked to share your ideas. So being a great speaker is not about the speaking, it's about the message. And the reason a speaker is chosen is because the audience wants or needs the message. So it's never about the speaker. It's always about the message. I wrote a book that came out this year. What to do when you're the speaker. And it's, it, I call it the Cathcart method for confident communication, but it's 54 little lessons for people who are already pretty decent speakers to know what do you do when you get to the meeting and you find out that you're meeting outdoors by the swimming pool and they don't have a sound system? Or what do you do when you get to the meeting and the speaker before you has gone overtime by 45 minutes and your 40 minute speech now has to be a 12 minute summary? What do you do when in the middle of your speech, the electricity goes out and you can't use your slides anymore and the room is now dark? 
What do you do when the building catches on fire and you're the only person with a microphone and there's 700 people in front of you who have to be evacuated? I've had all these things happen. What do you do when a drunk stumbles into the banquet of 400 people that you're speaking to and he challenges everybody to a fist fight? What do you do when your translator didn't make it to the meeting and you don't speak the local language? See, these are all things I've had to face. And... uh, if you don't know how to think about those things, then you're not going to have a good answer for them. And so I wrote a book about it and it's free. If anybody wants it, they can download it. It's free dot cathcart, C-A-T-H-C-A-R-T dot com. I did on, I did download the book and I was looking through the table of contents. I was like, oh my gosh, there's like all different types of topics that pertain, just like we were talking about, it's pertaining to speaking. I love it that most of them were only like one or two pages long. As I hear you explain each of those circumstances, like, you know, it also made me think about the samurai or the warrior going out into battle has already thought through different scenarios, like what makes them a great warrior, not because they just went in and faced their fear head on, but because they had already done the mental preparation to think about the things that could go wrong. Now you can't, you can't think about everything, but at least if you have a couple of plan A, plan B's in your mind before you have to face them. A good example of that is fire exits. Uh, I go to a meeting, I go to the room early always. And even if other people are busy or if there's nobody in the room, I, I, on my own, I look around the room at the exit signs and then I go explore them to see where they go. Because some of those exit signs, like you go through this door over here and it leads you to a hallway that goes down here, back there, around here, around there, and then finally out. Well, you could have gone just directly out that door and avoided being killed from smoke inhalation in the inner hallway. You know, so I check those things out in advance so that if I'm the only guy in the room with a microphone, that I I know how to behave responsibly and save my audience if they're in danger. This is the book, Mark, that I, I did for the book, What to Do When You're the Speaker. Look at the people who endorsed it. Les Brown, Brian Tracy, Ronald Reagan's son, Michael, Dr. Ivan Meisner of BNI, Dr. Nito Cobain, Patricia Fripp, all that, you know, all these people are top Hall of Fame names. And every one of them said, yeah, this is, this book is excellent. It's the Bible for speakers, you know, get one. Les Brown, in fact, when I asked him if he'd be willing to write me a little endorsement, called me up. He said, Jim, check your text. And I said, okay, hang on. I took the phone away from my ear. And there was a video from him endorsing my book. He did a video testimonial for me. How'd that make you feel? (laughs) Very, very good. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned something about, uh, you know, how that when you were in China and those kids were asking you how, you know, or people, kids asking you, how can they be a great speaker? And you said to them, go and be a great person. How would you define a great person? I would say, well, first off, being a great person means being the best version of you. It doesn't mean changing yourself. It means evolving to the next stages of your own development. Because the best thing you can be, and the only thing you can be really, is you. And every person, my belief is that every person was intended to be created. I don't believe that we are biological coincidences. Humanity is way too complex and too perfect in so many ways to have been just a cosmic accident. And so whatever your concept of our creator happens to be, everything that exists was created by someone or something, okay? So I believe that humanity because it's so distinctive from the entire animal kingdom and and plants and everything else, is an intentional existence. And that means people aren't born by accident. Well, yeah, you know, so-and-so was an accident because their parents didn't intend to have a child. 
their parents did the things that allow children to be born, they at least physically intended a child, even if they didn't emotionally. Well, okay, yeah. Who made that decision? People cannot create life. People are vehicles through life, which life can be created, but people can't decide in advance that they're going to have a particular, you know, have a child. It's going to be a gender, you know, that, that they specify or whatever. It can't be done. You can only facilitate the emergence of life. Try this. Get a seed and go to your garden and plant the seed and make it grow. You can't. You can allow it to grow. You can nourish it and nurture it, but that's not going to guarantee it's going to grow. And when it grows, you can't make it bear fruit. It'll do that when it's ready, if it's ready. So life's got its own agenda. We're just vehicles. I think we should be better vehicles. Be a better doorway for life to emerge through you. Live abundantly. Develop your mind, develop your body, develop your spirit, nurture your soul, care with, you know, connect with other people and care for other people, make a difference in the world. So mental, physical, family, social, spiritual, career, financial, emotional, that's, those are all aspects of your life. Live fully in every one of them. And as you do, you will, the echo effect of your existence will make life better for other people. And that's how you get rewards in life. You don't get them from going and taking, although you could do that, but the short-term payoff is offset by the long-term damage that'll be done to you as well as things in general. So go and do good because that's going to bring good back to you. Quickest way to to be a, a more frequent recipient of gifts from others is be the most beautifully grateful person they ever encountered. They'll think, man, I'm going to give her something else. (laughs) I love it. There's just so much in there. Yeah. To live life abundantly is, uh, I heard you say that. And well, that's John 10, 10 in the Bible. I've come that they would have life and have it more abundantly. So I took it out of a religious context and applied it to myself. That's what I'm here for to have life and have it more abundantly and do the same for other people. So if somebody comes up to you and they say, Jim, I don't, I don't feel like I'm living an abundant life. How would you respond to that? I would say then this is your starting point. Because if your life stinks currently, that doesn't mean it's going to be that way tomorrow. It means that's what you're starting from. Okay, so what needs to change? Well, I can't change anything. It's all out there. Excuse me. You start changing you and the things that are out there are going to affect you differently. And then you're going to be able to affect the things out there. So yes, you can, you can change. Well, you know, people hate me and, and you know, it, it's always raining and, and I'm just going to sit here and eat worms. Okay, uh, get over yourself. You're not that big of a deal. But you could be a great resource to the world if you would start focusing on the good you can do. Every person, regardless of station, could be kind towards somebody. They could be, they could pick up some trash they didn't put down. They could give some encouragement. They could point out something another person did well. They could provide a solution that another person hadn't discovered yet. Hey, you know, if you flip the lid open on that, it'll go easier. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought, thank you, right? There are little microscopic ways we can be helpful all day long with no education, with no high intellect, with no special skills. We can be ugly as a mud fence, as they used to say in Arkansas when I was growing up. We can be short, fat, uh, you know, tall, uh, skinny. We can speak awkwardly. And still we can do good every single day. Small steps. To Small big wins. Ste- I mean, look at people like Nick Wojcik. Nick Wojcik is from Australia. He lives in the United States now. He's a professional speaker. He has no arms and no legs. He has, let me say that again, no arms and no legs. He has one appendage 
It's like a finger that that's where he would have normally had a foot. I think he's a thalidomide baby. I, I'm not sure whether that's the case, but when he was born, he was born missing all the usual limbs. And yet he accepts himself and, and loves himself just like a person who's perfectly formed. He is a, a person of faith, a person with with a curious mind who's constantly learning and a person who cares enough about other people that he wants to be an inspiration to others. And thank heavens he has around him people that can it can help him through each day because he couldn't do it on his own. But he goes around the world giving speeches to enormous audiences, standing, if you can call it that, on a table on the stage, unable to get off of that table and get back on it. And he will even fall onto the table with wearing a microphone here and still speak and then contort himself around and stand up again as part of the presentation, talking about dealing with difficulties and, and accepting your circumstances. And when, you end, when you've heard the end of his speech, you're just sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, and I was complaining about how long it took the water to get hot on my faucet today. I was complaining because the mail came too late and I wasn't able to get that envelope before I went to the office. I was complaining because that's not the kind of eggs I wanted for breakfast. How selfish and stupid and, and wrong of me. Good heavens, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we put our trials and tribulations into perspective, when you have that type of comparison. My problem is, you know, the other people around me don't care for me. Well, excuse me, I've been watching and they they say plenty of things like, good morning. How are you? Great to see you. I love you. Things like that. Yeah, but they don't mean it. Ah, so the problem isn't them. Yeah, it's, it's in the interpretation. You. Yeah, it's in you. How much, you know, I, we, I, I mean, how much do we, and it's a lot of it's subconscious too, don't you think, where we project our thoughts out outside of ourselves rather than forcing yeah. ourselves to think about it internally and we take it so personally and we really shouldn't. I was asked on Sunday to deliver a prayer at our church. And in that prayer, I said, Lord, we know that thoughts are things that when we think in private, we've created something that is actually real. It's not physically, tangibly real, but it's real. And, you know, regardless whether you're a person of faith, thoughts exist and thoughts manifest and thoughts can be picked up on by other people who don't even know you because there are little subtle microscopic clues that we give as to how we're thinking that others can pick up on and not even realize what they're picking up on. They just, I don't know, it's something about him that just, you know, I, I just had a feeling, right? Well, where'd the feeling come from? Perception. Perception in what way? We probably saw some little microscopic something that we weren't aware we were seeing and it affected us. So, you know, we can control the thoughts we entertain and the thoughts we reject. We can't control so much which thoughts appear, but we can certainly control whether we open the door to them. I love that, that we're not, you know, like those things can enter our minds, but we can either accept or reject them. I think yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. What are your thoughts on a law of attraction? Well, the law of attraction, which comes from a, a, a book written by a man named Wallace Waddles back in 1910. What an unfortunate last name, uh, Waddles, uh, like on a turkey. Uh, the law of attraction is that what you think is it sets up a magnetism to draw toward you things that are compatible with that thought. So if you think hateful thoughts, you will attract ugly, hateful, mean things into your life. And if you think good thoughts, positive thoughts, loving thoughts, supportive, encouraging, caring thoughts, then you will attract more of that into your world. And there was a, a movie called The Secret that a woman named Rhonda Byrne put together 
amplifying that concept from Waddle's book. Um, but that's a reality that, you know, that there is a law of attraction like begets like. So the more you become a positive force, the more like me developing myself with those little statements, you know, training my own thinking over an extended period of time, listening to tapes, reading books, going to seminars and such. The more you do that, the more you attract that into your life. And that's why I wasn't alarmed when my circle of friends kind of drifted away. They were still there. They just weren't calling. And I wasn't concerned because I had a new circle of friends, albeit small at first, that has now become the top thought leaders and influencers in the world of personal development around the world. I mean, I've known and worked with all of these various people. Earl Nightingale, who I heard on the radio, I heard his recording. I followed his guidance. I got a job later, two years later, selling his recordings, his training programs, door to door to businesses in Little Rock, Arkansas. And 10 years later, he was selling my recordings and he sold three and a half million dollars worth of my first audio cassette album back in 1984 and 85. And when Earl Nightingale, who I'd heard on the radio when I was a clerk, when he passed away, I was the only outside speaker at his memorial service besides his widow. And his son was in the audience of a thousand professional speakers at the National Speakers Convention. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, that Amazing. I mean the mind. just sit in that for a minute. Here you were a clerk in 1972, and here you are 10 years later. You know, and, and it's almost like it's flipped. You were selling stuff for Earl Nightingale, and then he's selling stuff for you. The, yeah. Earl uh, had a, a company called Nightingale Conant Corporation, still exists. And they were selling Earl Nightingale's Lead the Field and Strangest Secret audio cassettes. But Lead the Field, this, this particular Lead the Field uh, cassette, audio cassette from back in the day, is called how much are you worth and it's talking about the worth of a human being and it's a very inspiring recording well earl recorded 36 no 48 of those and i bought all of them and then sold them to businesses in little rock when i was living back there i live in austin texas now and um 10 years later I was in business on my own. I had a business partner, Dr. Tony Alessandra from the University of San Diego. And we had formed Cathcart Alessandra and Associates and we were selling a training program of our own on personality types. We were one of the first in the country to do that. And Earl Nightingale called our office out of the blue. And I picked up the phone and almost went into shock. He said, may I speak to Jim Cathcart? And I said, which means this is he. And, and he said, this is Earl Nightingale. I said, I know. And he said, I, I like your concept. And I, my company sells audio programs. And I said, believe me, I, I understand. And he said, well, we, we'd like to publish yours if you'll re-record it to our standards. And I said, okay. And three and a half million dollars two years later, had been selling mine all over the world. And it was the first ever audio album on the subject of personality types, which everybody talks about today, you know, the four basic personality types. And it was called Relationship Strategies for Dealing with the Differences in People by Jim Cathcart and Tony Alessandro. Wow. That's, I love your stories. That's a great story. Early on, you talked about when you first started out, or even like right before you started out, you struggled with imposter syndrome. And then, you know, what are you going to say? Now, fast forward to that moment, you know, here, Earl Nightingale's call, uh, calling you. And then a little bit, we'll go a little bit more today, you know, do you still struggle with imposter syndrome? Not so much. But for years, I thought, you know, who am I? What am I saying? I mean, well, I, I take that back. My answer is yes, I do. Uh, but it's in a different way. Uh, today, it's it's mostly based on revenue in. 
In other words, I, I get into some situations where people think I'm a, a mega millionaire and I'm not, you know, and I, it, I clearly acknowledge lots of other people earn a whole lot more or have grown a whole lot more wealth than I have. But when you look at my career and my chosen path, that's only one of many, many measures and when I, when I start rattling off all those credentials like I did at the opening of this, it reassures me, Jim, you are totally qualified to be doing what you do. Your heart's in the right place. Your mind's in the right place. You're, you're not assuming that you know everything and trying to push it on others. You know, I'm still learning. And I'm saying, here's what I understand best. And I think this is the right answer but keep your mind open. So the way I teach is never in absolutes. It, it's always in this works, do this until we find a better way. How would you define the difference between wealth and success? Wealth is, is owning things that have financial worth, unless we talk about wealth in the broader concept of it. But wealth as, as it relates to money is having enough, having an abundance of money meaning more money than your bills, right? So you got a net worth to the positive. After all debts are settled, you, you still got money and that you've got the freedom to choose what to do without heavy financial restrictions. Not that you have enough to buy a country, but you have enough to buy a car. You know, you have enough to buy a new whatever. Um, that's wealth. And what was this, the other word you used? Success. Success, according to Nightingale, is the progressive realization, meaning you get more and more of it realized, made real, of a worthy ideal. The progressive realization of a worthy ideal. So it's something you want, a dream, a goal, a wish, and you are working toward it and progressively making progress right? That's Earl's definition. I would say success is living a satisfying and meaningful life. Satisfying to you, meaningful in the sense that it makes a difference. It matters that you exist. There was a guy in Lawrence, Kansas uh, named Leo Buerman, B-E-U-E-R-M-A-N. And you can look him, up, look him up on YouTube or just Google him. But Leo Buerman was a very small man with, with severe deformities. And he had to wear very thick glasses. And yet he had trained himself to do watch repair. So he could repair wristwatches. And he lived on his own, had a tractor that he would drive from his home to downtown Lawrence, I think it was. And he had a corner where he'd always park and he had a little cart and he would scoot himself along the street and sit in this particular location each day. And he would sell things like pencils and he would do repairs on things. And uh, that's how he sustained himself. And the town loved him so much, this little unassuming beggar, basically, uh, that they made a statue to him when he passed away. There's a bronze statue of him in his little cart. And they, they made a movie about him that I, uh, I saw back in the 1970s and used to show as part of seminars that I was doing. So don't ever think, you know, I'm nobody. I don't count. Anybody can make a difference anybody. But how many people though feel so freed by what we just talked about and how you defined wealth and success that they can look back and say, Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. I, I, you know, I am wealthy. You know, totally. I am wealthy. I don't live in a $2.3 million home, but you know, I live where I'm at and I touch the people around me and I care about them and I serve them and I have purpose in life. Yeah. It doesn't and get much better some than people that. Have said to me, yeah, but you know, I think I think people should be content. Uh, not so much. 
I think we should be at peace with where we're at and, and what our life is like. But that doesn't mean we should be content and not grow. Because if we stop learning, we stop becoming more intelligent, becoming capable of dealing with the evolving world intelligently. If we stop learning, then we become obsolete and we separate further and further from all of the people and all of society that's moving forward. Well, I don't want to change. Everything around you is in a state of evolution. You should be too. That doesn't mean you need to change. Keep your values. Keep your standards. But for heaven's sakes, figure out you know, how to get more information in and think it through and come to deeper conclusions, even if it reinforces what you already know, but also be willing to have it contradict what you think you already know. That, um, I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson said, every person in some way is my superior. And in that, I can learn from them. So if you think about you're wandering through an area and you see this guy that lives in the woods all alone, he's a hermit and he, you know, he's filthy and behaves basically like an animal. What in the world could you learn from him? How to live in the woods? Oh, well, yeah, on that subject, he knows more than I do. Duh. You know, you go into a new city and you see some, some, drunk on the street corner. Well, you've never been to the city. He lives there. So when it comes to understanding a little bit more about the local city, he knows more than you do. Well, I got a college degree. So what? It's not relevant to knowing about the city. You know, the things we know are only relevant in the context of the need for that. So, you know, we should lose the arrogance and realize everybody's got something for you. I was in, um, and pardon me for nonstop stories, but I was in uh, Georgetown, Malaysia a few years ago, 2019. And I was leading an experts academy that I teach. It's an ongoing uh, multiple month training program where I work with people on the basic life skills that, that allow us to be a professional success. And this group of people were from China. So I was always with my interpreter, Kitty Chun. And uh, we had been through classes for the last few days and we were taking an excursion from Penang, Malaysia to nearby Georgetown to a fishing village. And we're wandering through all the little shops and the stands and the stalls and the vendors and the beggars and everything. And there's a little group of us, maybe a dozen or so walking along and Kitty always at my elbow because I didn't speak Chinese. And um, as we walked along, I saw a beggar sitting there playing an old beat up guitar. And he's a really dark skinned guy from like India or, you know, that kind of dark skins. And um, he had a huge scar on the side of his face and he had an artificial leg and he was seated cross-legged and it, wearing sweatpants with holes in them so you could see the artificial leg showing through. And, uh, and he's playing guitar. And he's sitting in the dirt surrounded by a, a kind of a tiled area, leaning back against a post and a bunch of loose paper in front of him with his song notes, handwritten by him, song notes. And as we walk by, I noticed he's singing in English. I said, wait a minute, Kitty. And I turned back and I put some money in his hat because he was playing for tips. And and then I started to walk away and I said, hey, do you know any American songs? He said, I know Hotel California. And I said, outstanding. I said, "I'm I'm a guitarist and singer too. And he said, really? I said, yeah, can I sing it with you? And he said, well, sure. So he's fumbling through his pages, trying to find his Hotel California notes. And I sit down in the dirt next to him. And my my entourage, they go, (gasps) meaning, doesn't teacher know this man is unclean and he shouldn't be touching him or even talking with him, that this is beneath his, his station, right? 
So I'm sitting in the dirt and I'm intentionally shoulder to shoulder and knee to artificial leg with this guy intentionally. And he's smelly and sweaty and, you know, d- 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 not physically cool. <laughs> and, um, and I said, what's your name? He said, Halif. And I said, well, I'm Jim, you know, so we shook hands. And he said, would you like to play the guitar? And I said, well, sure. And so I take the guitar and I start playing the Hotel California and singing. And the people that are wandering through are gathered around and, and they don't know what to do. So they're, they're not sure if they should look at us or, or be around this or not. But something's, something bizarre is happening. And so they're, they're going to stay for the moment. And so I'm, you know, welcome to the Hotel California, such a lovely place, such a lovely place. That's Halif singing harmony. And so we're doing our our little thing and we finish it and a few people applaud and we just had a great time. And so I put my arm around him and we pose for selfies. And then I uh, thanked him for that. And I got up and dusted myself off and put a little bit more money in his hat. And he had gotten a few more tips during the course of that. And I wished him well and went on my way. So we're walking along, me and my entourage with Kitty at my elbow. And I said, Kitty, why did I do that? Because this is lesson time, right? Why did I do that? Yep. So she said... Jim, <laughs> why did you do that? And I said, you tell me. She said, because you love to play guitar. I said, no. And I said, get the group. And so the group came together, sort of a semicircle. And I said, translate. And I said, no, not because I love to play guitar. Everybody knows I love to play guitar and sing. But that's not why I did that. She said, well, why? And I said, well, first, let's all think about Halif. Every day, Halif, wherever he lives nearby, finds his way from home to this spot. And it's not easy for him because he's got an artificial leg and it's pretty clear he's been injured. So I would imagine he's probably in pain much of the time, if not all the time. Different places, different pains. I said, but every day he finds his way to this spot. And he doesn't have a locker nearby where he can stash his guitar and notes. He has to carry them with him to and from so that nobody steals them or destroys them. So he gets here and he sets up in his little spot and he probably has to occasionally compete with others for the spot. But for now it's working. And all day long, 100% of the people he encounters look down on him. Physically, they look down on him because they're standing above him. And attitudinally, they look down on him as a lower type of life. And so there's no respect coming from anybody all day long. And he's playing and singing in hopes to please enough of them that they will contribute tips that allow him to survive yet another day. That has to be a horrible challenge. And they said, yeah, yeah. I said, okay. So I came along and I saw what you saw. And I thought, hey, we can speak the same language. And it just hit me. I want to sing a song with him. And so I sat down with him. And we, for the duration of that song, were brothers in music. We were equal in every way. I wasn't ahead of him, behind him. I was right beside him and we were both completely equal. And at the end, I put my arm around him and braced him as a, as a fellow music lover and then went on my way. How long do you think he will remember that experience? And I paused and they said, for the rest of his life. And I said, and so will I. And then I paused again and I said, every one of you has the capacity to do something like that every single day. 
takes no education, no intellect, no training, no skill. It just takes a heart. Do the same. Yeah, we. I don't even have a word to say to that, Jim. That's an amazing I understand, story. Because it's a moving yeah. experience. Yeah, and I have, I have a video clip of that. I, the, yeah, actually, you know, my agent, How? Dr. Dr. David Chu, took a, a video yeah. of the two of us. How much doing of that. our day do we really? And what I appreciate about that story is how much of our day do we just mindlessly go through the motions? And we forget that there are micro opportunities to do things like that. Maybe not to that quote unquote magnitude or that length of time, because I'm sure it took, you know, I bet you it was 10, 15, I don't know how much time. Gosh, five minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So five (laughs) minutes. Oh, well, the way you tell the story, it sounds like it must've been a half an hour, but you know, but still one song. Yeah, you well, Hotel California can go for a while, depending on yeah, how, that's true, how long, we did how, long you, uh, how long you how long you sing it. <laughs> but but even that, but then not only that, not only did you not only did you acknowledge the man and you showed compassion, kindness, and you followed your heart on that, but you you also took the opportunity to teach those who were yeah. around you as well. And that is a, it's a gift, number one, to recognize it. Number two, it's a skill to understand that you have that that quality to teach to others. But how much- yeah. And thank heavens I've had the opportunity to dedicate my career to teaching life skills. Yeah, yeah. there you go. There you go. I, I just, I think the thing I pull out of it is that to slow down and savor life and look for the micro opportunities to influence and touch one person. And you're right, yeah. we can we you know, can do it every day if we're looking for it. And when you do it, your soul shines. I bet. Your heart grows and glows. Like my friend Ron Arden, a speech coach from South Africa, who I did some work with in San Diego years ago. I was telling him one of my stories, and it was a story like that one about stopping to acknowledge somebody that didn't have any power. And um, he said, Jim, he said, I was recently in Atlanta to do some speech coaching. And I went to a restaurant alone. And while I was dining, I saw an older couple, I mean, really older, like 90s, that are sitting at the table together, dining and holding hands and flirting with each other and laughing. And it was just such a beautiful thing to observe. So as I was leaving the restaurant, I thought, what would Jim do? And I walked over to them, said, excuse me. And they said, oh, hello. And I said, may I make an observation? And they said, well, sure. And I said, I I don't know if you two are just young lovers or dear friends or whatever it is, but but you have a a quality about you that is an absolute joy to observe. And they said, what a wonderful thing to say. How nice of you. Would you like to sit and join us? He said, no, I just wanted to share that observation. So thank you. And then he went on his way. He said, Jim, I knew that if I did that, it would make them feel good. What I didn't realize is how good it made me feel about myself. Because I wasn't focused on myself. I was focused on the quality in me that was making other, making things better for others. And he said, and even to this day, I have good feelings remembering the good that I did in that moment. And it took nothing on my part. What I really want to capture in what you said is that when he did that for somebody else, it filled him. And how often we will convince ourselves that, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say anything to them. You know, that's not, I'm not going to get anything out of it. We don't do things because we're looking to get something out of it. But in that case, he just did something, wasn't looking for anything out of it, but the byproduct was the satisfaction in blessing somebody else's day and sharing a positive observation with them. I love that. And I just, I just want to pull that out so that we don't miss the beauty of that. How we, there's another way to say it. You could even say, be selfish, be unselfish for selfish reasons. What does that mean? means be generous like that, be giving, be caring like that for the payoff. If you want, I don't care why you do it, just do it. 
you know, because you're going to benefit from it as well as the other people benefiting from it. But, you know, your heart really ought to come from a giving posture, not a not a getting posture. But that's why I'm a mentor. That's why I do what I do for a living. You know, I like to help other people get to where they want to go and be able 45 years from now to look back at those little notes that kept them on the path and kept them growing along the way. So what you're doing through this podcast, what I do through my mentorship, working with people as a, a mentor to experts, you know, that's we're in our ways creating echoes that make the world a better place. Yeah. Yeah. Just creating and, and giving back. I love it. I love it. So Jim, project yourself. Uh, what would 20 year out from now, Jim, uh, turn around and say, current Jim sitting right here, what would they have to say? Yeah. yeah. Well, 20 year, out, think about this 20 year out from now, uh -huh. I would be age 97. Okay. I'm 77 today. I have so an aunt that passed away at 101. So 100% wow, wow. positive, 100% so plausible. <laughs> Love it. So 97 year old me would say to, to current me, Hey Jim, send some more money ahead. <laughs> Meaning, you know, be, be more financially responsible. So there's more left when you get to my age. Right. So when I get to his age at 97, that there would still be some resources left. And I think that's good advice, no matter what your age, send some, some of today's money ahead to the person you'll be many years from now. Perfect. Yeah. And so forth. Yeah. The, the the variation on that question is if you could go back in time and tell your younger self and deliver a message, what would it be? And every once in a while, I get flack for that question, so I twisted it on you. <laughs> if I if I went the other direction, I would just say to the younger me, stay the course. Yeah, that's you what know, I don't, don't go down the little cul-de-sac. Stay on the main path, and yeah. make everything you do reinforce that decision right there, and so that you get the full power of everything you do. Do you feel like way back then when you decided you were going to go into personal development and you were going to study people and study relationships, did that feel natural to you? Almost like, you know, yes, that's yeah, it. It, did. Yeah. it felt like it, this, I never questioned whether I was on the right path. I, I questioned whether I was on it in the right way, you know, and I tried lots of different variations of this career. Um, some of which paid off beautifully and others only marginally. Uh, I even got into a partnership at one time that cost me a lot of heartache and money, uh, but bounced back fine a couple of years later. And my partnership with Dr. Tony Alessandro was an absolute blessing to my life. And we're still best friends today. And that's, we met in 1979, you know, so I'll be staying at his home in May when I do my Experts Academy Summit in nice. La Jolla. Uh-huh. Yeah. Nice. You know, well, so there you go. Yeah. So back then, you know, like you found, you started to see your purpose. It was something that resonated with you and your soul. And then you started going for, you know, going forward and pursuing that today it could come across as, you know, what's your North star? What's your mm -hmm. purpose? What would you say to somebody would be their first small steps if they really don't know what their purpose is, what their North Star is? What would your advice be to them to get started? I, I created a video program for that purpose, a, a little course that's uh, 16 short lessons, um, about four hours total called Acorns to Oak Trees. It, I don't even get the money from it. $99 if they want to subscribe. Just go to Corsify, C-O-U-R-S-I-F-Y X dot com slash acorns and they can sign up. But the, the whole course is about answering one question. What do you want? What do you want? What do you care about? When you look back over your life and you look forward in your dreams, what's the common theme? What is it that bugs you that you're trying to make it go away? What is it that excites you that you're trying to bring in? What do you care about? What do you want? Because when you're clear on what you want and you stay that course, the world starts looking for ways to give it to you. 
Jim, I have thoroughly enjoyed, I am enjoying our conversation, but you I know, like too, it, thank at you. some point, yeah, the, the podcasts have to end. And it, I, I always, every once in a while, I come across the, <laughs> where, where, you know, we, we have to wrap it up at some point or we could just yeah. go for like another two hours. Um, so all of my guests, I have core three questions that I ask. So let's okay. move into that. The first is, can you please share a book or resource that has had a significant impact on you? And I know that's a loaded question. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, all the classic books I mentioned earlier, which are right there over my shoulder, you know, Think and Grow Rich, How to Win Friends and Influence People, The Power of Positive Thinking, etc. And this, uh, The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddles. Also, another I just read book, that. Wallace. I just read that book, Wallace Waddle, The One, The what? Science of Getting well, Rich. Now, yeah. read, now read his book written in 1911, How to Be a Genius. And the interesting thing is in that book, he says, genius is reading the mind of God. Whoa. In other words, reading the universe to find out what are the universal truths, what are the, what are the fractals in nature that are unchanging, no matter what the application. Find the truth behind the truth behind the truth, and then build on that. Um, so wisdom, that, that's where that comes from, is looking for the absolute unshakable basis of whatever it is that you're teaching um, or whatever you're studying. And um, Og Mandino's series of books, uh, mostly the, how, the Greatest Salesman in the World, which is not just about selling, it's an ancient biblical times parable telling a story of discovering some secret scrolls that told the secret to life and that wonderful book how to, uh the greatest salesman in the world by og og mandino og short for augustine get live a thousand years by giovanni libera it reads like a disney movie and it's absolutely profound but a thoroughly enjoyable read oh awesome so second question is, what is one question or topic you wish I would have asked about and how would you have answered or expanded on the topic? I'm pretty happy with what we've done. And um, my fear in answering that would be that we'll go another half hour today and I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here. Oh, I have another like podcast to. after this one. <laughs> I'd like to. Yeah, we could do this again. Yeah, yeah that's what another podcast three. is for. Yeah, the, good, go. the good news is I'm going for a thousand podcasts and I'm only on uh, 120. So we have a, a lot of time. Good. <laughs> so it's great. So as we come to a close, here's the last one. What is one small step that someone can do today that's going to help them change their tomorrow? Wow. Decide that today is the day your life began to change course toward the good. Today is the day that you started to notice more and to make decisions based on what you truly care about so that you're like a tailor adjusting the collar, the button, the sleeve length. You're like a tailor tailoring your life to be a better, perfect fit for who you are in your heart of hearts. You can tailor your life. You can't necessarily change your whole wardrobe, but you can tailor your life to where it's a perfect fit, ultimately, for who you are. Thank you. Thank you for Thank that. You. Jim, how, Jim, how can people find you? Easy. Just remember my name and look for me. Jim Cathcart, C-A-T-H-C-A-R-T. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Vimeo. I'm on uh, even TikTok and X and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Facebook and LinkedIn is where I live most of the time digitally. And of course, cathcart.com is my website. And jimcathcart.com is my digital business card. And so it's got everything in there, including my TED Talk. You can watch the TED Talk right there in the business card. So I'm an easy, easy guy to find and reach out. If, you, if you're looking for a mentor, you're interested in my program, by all means, you know, get in touch and let's see if it's right for you. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the gift of your time. This has been an amazing conversation. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. I feel the same. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I value your time with me and I seek to make every moment count. In order to make lasting change in your life, listening is usually not enough. So I want to ask you, what practical steps are you going to put into action today as a result of listening to this podcast? Remember, any step, any action, no matter how small, starts your journey to a big win. And if you're not sure where to get started, check out my website, personalcoachfinder.com and find someone who can help. Remember, life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by choice. Take small steps today and make your life awesome, friends.